thank you very much to, to everybody who's who's joined us for this session on the future of single cell research in Africa. Um, we've had an exciting two days. And as the symposium draws to an end, I think we've, we've had some very interesting talks. Um, I think the last one by Christian Happy ranks among one of the best of them. And Christian, you kind of were ushered off stage because you had so much to to um, to talk about. Had so much good work in genomics and Ebola and Lassa fever, yellow fever. What do you see from your perspective to be the the future of single cell research in Africa? Um, I do think that, you know, um, moving forward, I and mean, then what I've seen, I think Africa has a lot to offer. And especially with, um, um, with uh, what COVID has done is actually accelerating, you know, acquisition of genomic platforms that could be very important in order to move in single cell research forward on the continent. Uh, prior to COVID, probably were probably the only center on the continent that have Novasik and, 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 and some of those, but then a few labs who have that now. And then, you know, and we, as I said before, and then showed on that map, I'm sure that map was pre-COVID where we have about 200 sequencing platforms on the continent, but now I'm sure those numbers probably could be double, if not triple. Virtually all countries do have that. And I think, you know, that presents a unique opportunity you know, not to reinvent the wheel, but to leverage, you know, the, the, the platforms that are available, but also the skills that could be pivoted, you know, and uh, uh, to work just apart from doing genomics, but also to leverage, I mean, I mean, but to do, you know, to advance, you know, the human cell atlas agenda, and then especially single cell genomic on the continent. I think it's basically just leveraging what is existing. We do have the platforms, we do have the skills, and and then both both soft skills and then um, I mean wet skills and then bioinformatics skills. Uh, Nikki is here. She's driving a very uh, 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 what I call important and very fruitful program on the continent. And I think all of those you know uh, could be leveraged. And the H3 Africa platform, for instance, has has generated an incredible amount of data and then uh, also an incredible amount of uh, infrastructure that could, that could be leveraged in order to move you know the HCA you know, agenda forward on the continent. I think the future is very promising. You mentioned something around education and you've also mentioned the work of Nikki and I just wanna get Nikki to opine a little bit on the context of these expanding genomic platforms. Um, Christian had a nice slide where he outlined, you know, really key steps in education. He mentioned your work in H3 Africa what are your thoughts on how these things synergize to expand single cell research in Africa? Thanks. I think um, the you know the main question is accessibility. Um, so uh, you know, when we looked at the first few years of H3 Africa, all the samples were shipped shipped off the continent for the the genomics data generation. <clears throat> and I think you know the single cell work was the same. Everything had to be shipped off the continent because we didn't have the the research infrastructure here. And if there is research infrastructure here, it's actually just the consumables getting consumables into African countries is, is a lot more expensive than you know to to run these experiments overseas. But people like Christian have have changed that. Um, through building these, you know, major genomics facilities on the continent. And so we need to couple that with the bioinformatics. So we, we've been developing <clears throat> huge bioinformatics capacity, but there still seems to be, um, which is quite sad actually, a disconnect between those who can do it and those who need bioinformatics. So we need to, to sort of couple the, the training um, with the platforms. So in South Africa, for example, we've got the Diplomics Initiative where they're trying to have the all the omics platforms sort of um, talking to each other and then couple the training to that. So we have skilled people both running the platforms, doing the initial processing of the data as it comes off the platform, and then having that liaison that almost like an interpreter of the, of the, the you know, the person who's generated the data to the person who's gonna analyze and interpret that data. And the skills actually required are, are not just, oh, well, I'm just gonna run a few programs and then I know what, you know, you have to, you have to understand um, you know, the, the underlying basis for how the data were generated. You have to understand the, the um, parameters used. What, were, what, what are the, the setbacks of some of the technologies? You know, can you, you know, do you need to factor that into your analysis? And then, of course, the statistical analysis, um, the biological interpretation. So we need to, as I say, couple that a bit more, um, build our training 
closer to the platforms so that the people who are generating the data actually get that uh, support either through um, bioinformatics service people who can support them and help them with the analysis or ideally through uh, imparting those skills to those people who have the data. So the last thing you want to do is have that, you know, finally get the data generated on the continent and then have that shipped off the continent for the analysis and interpretation because our local researchers don't know how to interpret and analyze the data. So we are very happy to, you know, to work with the platforms, you know, first to disclaim that single cell is not, is not my field, but, you know, we have enormous expertise in how to build training programs, how to um, build the basic skills, how to... Um, enable African researchers to analyze their own data, to empower them to analyze and interpret their own data. So I think if we if we couple those together, I think we have um, you know the power to, to really go quite far in, in, in single cell work. Thanks, Tiki. Um, Alfred, you're kind of a pioneer in Africa, I think, because you're actually doing a lot of single cell work. What would you say to all of these kind of reflections on the future of single cell and your own experience as a pioneer in this field in Africa. Uh, well, <laughs> thanks, thanks, Musa. Just to say, I, I'm not a single cell specialist at all. Um, I, I work on malaria, and, and, and of course, I do have intentions to do single cell stuff, um, just like many many other scientists across Africa. I think Nikki, Nikki and Chris have touched on two very important aspects, uh, and but all honing in on the issue of investment. Investment not only on platforms, but investment in human resources to be able to give Africa the drive in single cell sequencing and the use of that data. So I will touch on the seven aspect of it, which is how this is translated. And for that investment to come, I think there is there's a significant pre-investment that is needed. And that is the engagement part of it. Um, this includes engagement in, of the scientific community, which is what we're doing here. But secondly, there's the engagement of the social community and the, the other stakeholder, which is actually our public and health um, governance structures and, and individuals. Uh, that's where we're going to face a huge hurdle when it comes to translation. So in terms of the future, I've seen we, we actually setting the pace by, by getting these platforms ready here. Nikki and others and many others across the continent are building the momentum with having those with skills. I think we have to find a way to sustain it by maintaining those people that have been trained in the continent. My case, for example, is very particular because I spent the last six years trying to train informaticians and keep them here. But the most successful ones go. The best ones leave the, leave and go somewhere else. And I say this is because we need the investment to keep them because we need their skills. And we need the encouragement from the stakeholders, which is the government parties, as well as the external funders, to be able to sustain and keep this momentum that is building in the continent. So I see future. I see a future that is going to be great across diseases, where the application is not only going to be where disease has started and where people are already mobbing, but where we're going to actually have um, use these technologies to, to try to look for markers to predict before diseases actually emerge. So that's my wish for HCA across, across the continent, and I, I only hope that we're able to sustain this momentum that we're building now. Thank you so much. It's a really insightful answer. And I like the way you sort of partitioning the kind of role of virus prediction, pathogen analysis to um, to really like almost blue sky research um, and really something that's been not as strongly driven in Africa, but enables us to be kind of knowledge creators in Africa as opposed to knowledge takers. Um, we have a couple of questions um, in the, the chat and um, I'm gonna, read out the first question, which is from one of the speakers who was speaking yesterday, uh, Dorit Hockman, and she asks a great question, which I think is quite relevant. Uh, would a dedicated single cell analysis workshop for specifically for graduates on the African continent be possible so they can analyze their own data? Um, now, before I kind of get everybody's opinion on that question, because I'm sure you all have an opinion, I want to point out that the HCA has been working very hard to do exactly this. And we've been very fortunate uh, to be supported by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative to hold different roadshows around the world. Um, and these will we are doing in Southeast Asia, in the Middle East, and we'll also do one um, 
at least one or two in different parts of Africa to do exactly this. So, um, but I would love to hear from our panelists if they have very specific ideas on how such a dedicated workshop on single cell analysis and basically single cell techniques should be conducted in Africa. And um, I guess to do this fairly Christian, um, your thoughts. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Musa. I, I do think that, you know, that um, first of all, uh, young Africans all across are very hungry. Hungry, I mean, hungry for knowledge, not hungry for food, but they're very hungry for knowledge. And really, um, uh, bringing such workshop to the fore will be very transformational. And remember that many of them now have been equipped thoroughly for genomic, you know, um, knowledge. I mean, with genomic knowledge. So it's basically just leveraging those, I mean, the knowledge and the skill that they already acquired to expose them to something that is relatively new and that can also be very transformational. But what is good about um, um, about uh, planning a workshop or doing workshops in Africa is the fact that the platforms already exist. You know, we have very solid platforms for, you know, uh, 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 hands-on training, you know, in genomics, for instance, if you look at my talks, so in the past seven weeks, we've been in seven different, I mean, three different African countries. During this pandemic, we've trained people from 32 different African countries, boosted an incredible number, I mean, in, in a very incredible manner, the number of genomes generated by SARS-CoV-2 genomes in Africa. In 2020, you imagine we ended 2020 with 5,000 genomes on the continent, but by September 2021, you know, because of the trainings and then the capacity building, Africa moved to about 75,000 genomes, 12-fold increase. And as I'm speaking to you, we'll probably find over 100,000 genomes. So, and really this shows a potential, you know, impact of such trainings, you know, in young Africans. And, you know, I think the idea should be for ACA to leverage, you know, the, the, the what I call the centers of excellence that are well established and that I have track record in training and capacity building to really transform and then advance the agenda of, I mean, of, of single cell by leveraging the facility and then the structure that are already existing, but also leveraging what I call the bioinformatics, you know, um, knowledge and then the nodes and platform that are existing through Nikki, for instance, you know, in order to really show, yeah, I mean, I mean, to demonstrate that this can be actually, that, that can move in Africa much more faster than a lot of people think. Over. Nikki, your thoughts on on such a dedicated single cell analysis workshop, especially given your you know very strong track record with the H three Africa initiative, and as you said, you maybe you don't work in single cell, but how would how would you quote unquote prepare um, the cohorts of of students and and trainees that you have to to work with such data? So we, um, as Christian said, everybody's hungry for knowledge. And so when we open, you know, um, any courses, we get thousands, literally thousands of applications. So I think the key thing here, um, what we've learned over the years, is that, that the training needs to be associated very much with somebody's data that they have now or are about to have. So if somebody's doing this hypothetically because in two years' time they're going to have data, it's too early. Um, and um, one of the things we've experimented with, especially you know, with a, with a virtual um, environment that we stick, we sort of stuck with, is having sort of theoretical training leading up to a hackathon or a data jamboree. So where people aren't working on somebody else's hypothetical data sets, they're actually working with their own data because once they come and you know work with real data. Uh, and the courses tend to work with beautiful data sets where everything works because you have to do it in a certain time. So then when they come to work with their own data, they actually don't have that, that support. So you want to have people who, who get the theoretical knowledge, then they come into a maybe a hackathon or a data jamboree or sort of the combination of that theoretical training where they are sitting with their data, getting their hands dirty with those experts around them. And so I think that sort of format hackathon jamboree seems to work quite well for us because they're you know, very outcomes driven. You come out with at least half your, your analysis done and you've asked all the questions on your data for you know, what it is that you need to do. The other thing that is very important that we've seen is the after course support. So people go to a course and then they go home and then they're stuck. So you need to have the environment in the course that they're going to have at home because you don't, there's no point going to a course and having a beautiful software platform and then you go home and you don't have access to it anyway. 
Um, but you also need that downst downstream support because it's when you carry on with your analysis, you have a quick question for somebody. Who do you ask if there's nobody in your environment to ask? So I think um, having um, actual analysis driven training on their, their actual data and then that downstream mentoring and support afterwards, I think is really important for, for a workshop like this if we wanted to make this something like this effective in Africa. Um, Alfred, do you want to add anything that hasn't been mentioned before that you think could kind of broaden our, our thoughts here? No, just 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 one word on this. I, I think I, I, I do agree with what Nikki and Chris has said. And I, I think one of the problems we face is that the base is not large enough. And as Nikki indicated, each time she has an advert out, right, thousand applications that come through probably for, for a few hundred places or less than that. So the number of workshops that need to be organized to broaden the base and also help us not to have this level of high attrition rates due to demotivation from lack of data or from lack of interaction and, and, and a career vision um, would probably work best if we continue to organize such workshops. So a dedicated workshop definitely would be useful, including all the other workshops we are organizing for bioinformatics capacity in the continent. So one of the things I, I want to bring up here is um, the HCA is a very bottoms up community around the world, and it's made up of scientists who really are working on a very consensus-driven model of driving the future of, of single-cell research. And um, I didn't want to kind of influence your answers to this question that was asked, but one of the things to bear in mind is that the HCA is working very much in building tissue-based atlases. So um, lung atlases, liver atlas, gut atlas. And one of the things that really drives us to be want a concerted effort to include Africa in this, not only because it's kind of a moral obligation, but also because those atlases that we're building are absent of that component of data from Africa. And I guess one of the things that's happened that you've mentioned, Alfred, is there's a brain drain. But on the other side, there's also kind of an entire uh, scientific vision around the HCA that does not incorporate African ideas, if you like, or African participation. And I'd really like to kind of get an opinion from, from you. We don't, we have about 10 minutes left. So I'd really like each of you to kind of give us an opinion on how integrating the roadmap for the HCA the current role of the HCA fits with, you know, participation from different African institutes and centers of excellence that Christian has brought up. And I guess, Christian, you're the first one I'll ask this question to because, so two things, there is a roadmap. How does Africa integrate itself into this roadmap, maybe jumping off these centers of excellence you've mentioned? And two, I think brain drain and nutrition rate is a big thing. And we've got to, you know, address that. So, go ahead, Christian. Uh, thank you, Musa. I, I do think that you know, um, HCA will benefit a lot actually by having Africa data. I mean, remember, ninety percent of um, diversity within human genomes are in Africa. So, how do you think that you really want to do a human atlas, cell atlas, without really taking into account that diversity? I think you know it's a very important and very crucial for 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 ACA to really you know try as much as possible to integrate you know Africa within this otherwise um I, I mean look I mean looking at the future it might end up being not a very productive exercise. So I think it's important to first of all take that on. And also I think uh, to avoid brain drain, I think it's important to also uh, not only um, uh, uh, engage Africa early enough in order to you know excite the young ones with the kind of data and then the impact you know, that this could be, but also resources are needed. <clears throat> and as, as you said, it's, it's uh, yes, we see brain drain, but I think that if you create environments that are attractive enough with resources, you can reverse the brain drain. I, I do see in my lab, I do have young guys from Harvard, from Cambridge, from Oxford, you know, reverse coming back simply because there is a platform. And I think it is, we own that responsibility as we are developing uh, something, I mean, a, I mean, a roadmap of SCA to think about, you know, um, 
uh, augmenting or adding value to the existing platforms to actually attract young Africans in the diaspora, you know, to come and then, I mean, and, and then add their own intellect. Because, you know, this whole idea of um, scientists in Africa um, or, or creating SCA only with African-based scientists is not going to work. We really need to bring those in the diaspora to add value and then to increase the base as Alfred mentioned. We need a, we need a broad base and a very strong base. And that we, and, and in order for us to do that, we need to augment on the resources that are available while leveraging, you know, the previous investments. Thanks for that answer. Nikki, addressing the brain drain, integrating into the HCA roadmap. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, Christian's right with, if you even if you just look at the, the, the human reference genome and HCA is a reference data set, it's not complete. It's, it's completely missing, you know, your, your huge diversity. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, I think it's always hard to join something that exists. So HCA is an existing organization that's been very much north, northern led. Um, and so for African scientists to join it, you know, when you join something, as I say, what it is, you always one step behind. But actually, the African researchers can join by setting their agenda. Obviously, there's certain ideals that HCA wants to achieve. You have your healthy states, um, you know, and then there's the, 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 the disease atlas. And, you know, as, as we've heard in, in uh, some of the talks today, diseases are obviously of, of more importance to African researchers than, you know, worrying about the healthy state because we have such a high burden of diseases. But let the African scientists drive the agenda of, you know, their participation in HCA. What is a, a priority to them? So if you come and say, well, actually, HCA should, should focus on this, if it's not a priority to Africans, why, why would you, you know, enforce that? So I think the main thing is, is for, for participation is to get the African researchers to, to drive that agenda. I mean, one of, as a human, you know, population genetics in, person of in, uh, person is interested in that. You know, I see that that there's there's a lot of population specific expression, gene expression, and epigenetics, and that, that is, is is you know enormous. Asia Africa has generated huge amounts of, of population genetic um, and and you know African genetic variation data. So we can actually start, you know, build build from from those kinds of things that have been um, and done, as well as obviously all the other research that we've heard about today that have come from from African. Um, researchers, but if you're looking at the healthy states, you know, think about how we can leverage the, the interests and the data that has already been generated from African researchers so that they can drive the agenda when they when they join. When it comes to brain drain, um, you know, it's it's a it's a matter of the grass is always green on the other side. So if we build the infrastructure and we build the facilities and we build those really exciting projects that are led from here, I think we will attract people back again. Um, you know, we can we can involve the diaspora as well, but you know, we need to make we need to make it attractive for people to stay. And you know, as soon as they go over and see somebody else's shiny equipment, you know, it, it's much more attractive to leave. So we need to make uh, the projects exciting. We need to make the infrastructure available so that the hurdles are, are lower for them. You know, to to carry out the exciting research that they want to do in Africa. Thank you for that great answer. Alfred? Yeah, I mean, that's the uh, Nikki and Chris have said it all, but uh, just to say, uh, I, I would like to say, what are the reasons why people work? And, and, and I think people work for two reasons because they like to work, and secondly, because they need to leave. And if you like to work, you need to have an impact and you need to like what you're working on. So, how do we make people like the work that they're doing, especially with regards to SE? They need to have value in it, they need to have ownership. Then the rest of it is to motivate them to stay and see that value in the work that they're doing. So I, I think we still need a lot of investment when it comes to training and motivating people to like the work and stay. We have a people in Africa, a lot of um, trainees, I mean, including myself, that do things not because we really want to do them, but we do them actually just because we need to do them to leave. So we, we need to change that. I know we probably are not at a level where everyone will do what they like to do, but we need to start bringing that into science where we get the students, we get the trainees that like to do genomics, they like to do HCA work, to find value in it, take ownership of it, define the priorities, get it done, and stay on it. And to keep them on it, when they develop the expertise, we need the investment to keep them motivated by giving them a life that is worthy of their investment in time and brain. This is really important, and I think that's where we are failing, but not because I don't have the money, I have to look for someone to get me the money. And I, I spent all my life writing grants, and just like other scientists do. So we, we need more investment at, 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 in, in a nutshell. We need more investment to broaden the base, increase the motivation, and provide ownership for people to see value in the work they're doing. Thank you so much, Alfred. Those are really great answers. And I just want to read a, a comment from one of the few 
speakers who we had from Brazil, Patricia Severino. And this will be the last word because we have to close the session. But she says, if you think this is relevant, we have done exactly the same in Latin America, single cell RNA analysis for local students and have had a great experience. We would be glad to share our ideas and results from the point of view of organization and feedback. I think that's really hopeful to learn from the Latin American experience and, and leverage that to what is happening in Africa. So with that, we'll close this panel discussion and our next one will start in maybe five minutes and it's gonna be the Ask Me Anything panel discussion and we'll have Aviv Regev, Maz Hanifa and um, uh, Man Zawati and, and myself who you can ask anything. Thank you very much for attending and thanks for really great answers from our panelists.